Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In his poem on the nature of things, Lucretius is going to repeat a maxim coming down all the way from Epicurus, death is nothing to us. In Latin, nihil igitur mors est ad nos. And he follows that up as well by saying, neque pertinet hilum. So, you know, literally from these things are there for death is for us nothing, nihil. Uh, it, is, it doesn't have being at all, nor does it pertain, nor does it apply, nor does it have any sort of value, not even a little bit. That's the helum, a trifle, right? And so this is a rather bold declaration, and he's going to provide us with some argument for that. He's already considered how it is that the mind and the spirit are not immortal, as some people have claimed in other philosophical schools or in religions, for better or for worse. And then he's going to say, uh, here's some other considerations to ease your mind. Because the ultimate goal of this is to have a happy, contented life. So he begins by saying that, you know, when you die, there's, there's really nothing left to the mind or the spirit, as he puts it, torn from the body. You, you only have a mind or a spirit, uh, a animus or anima, and these are interconnected themselves, when you actually have a living body. So he says, um, in days of old, we felt no worry when the hosts of Carthage poured into battle on every side. Um, so when we shall be no more, when the union of body and spirit that engenders us, that's what we are, has been disrupted to us who shall be nothing, nothing by any hazard will happen anymore at all. Nothing will have the power to stir our senses, not through earth, uh, not though earth be fused with sea and sea with sky. And he says, if any feeling remains in the mind or the spirit after it's been torn from our body, that is nothing to us. This word nothing is coming up an awful lot in this. Why? Because we are brought into being by the marriage, by the binding of body and spirit. That is literally what we are. And so he goes on, he says, even if the matter that composes us should be reassembled by time after our death and brought back into its present state, if the light of life were given to us anew, so like imagine something like uh, being brought into being once again from some pattern that uh, was stored somewhere. He says, even that contingency would be no concern of ours once the chain of our identity had been snapped. That's a different person. It's sort of like the old teleporters in the Star Trek thing. It's not really you that's being reconstituted. It's it's a different thing that, that's like you. There, there isn't any you anymore, so you don't have to worry about that, he's saying. He goes on further and he says, there is no existence, there is no being of a you after your death who is going to suffer, right? He says, we who are now are not concerned with ourselves in any previous existence. You don't remember it. You don't know about it. It may as well not even exist, even if it, you know, if, if there was any previous existence. And he says, when you look at the immeasurable 
extent of time gone by and the multiform movements of matter, you'll credit that these same atoms that compose us must have been in many, many other combinations before now. There's really nothing special about the current configuration that is us. And there isn't any dead self to suffer, to worry about things, to be bothered by anything. He says, if the future holds misery and anguish in store, you got to have a self. The self has to be in existence. So you really only can suffer in this life. This is the only life, according to Lucretius and Epicurus. This is the only place you can actually have any suffering. So he says, um, when the time comes, uh, the self must be in existence in order to be miserable. But from this fate, we are redeemed by death, which denies existence or being to the self that might have suffered these tribulations. And, you know, this goes back to Epicurus saying, you don't need to worry about death because when death is here for you, there isn't any you for the death to be here for. You're dead. There's no, there's no you anymore. And then he goes on and he says something really quite psychologically astute. He says, well, you know, people do project ahead to their own death and they get quite upset when they think about the things that might be happening, say, to their body or their stuff or their good reputation. And what are they actually doing in those cases? They are sort of imaginatively projecting themselves into a time when, by definition, they do not exist. So they're imagining in the present what the future without them but with them in a certain way is going to look like. So he says, when you find a person treating it as a grievance that after death, they were, will either molder in the grave or fall a prey to flames or the jaws of predatory beasts, be sure his utterance does not ring true. His heart is stabbed by a secret dread. However loudly the man himself may disavow the belief that after death he will still experience sensation. I, I am not, I'm convinced he does not grant the admission he professes. So if he really understood things, he wouldn't be worried about that sort of matter. So this is the st sort of standard Epicurean view. He also has a really interesting argument about death and sleep. And this, this might actually be a reference back to Plato's Apology, where Socrates argues uh, that death isn't going to be so bad because one of the possibilities is it's like the best sleep you've ever had in your life. You, you know, you're so rested, nothing disturbs you. And Lucretia says, yeah, so think about sleep, right? When you are sleeping, what happens? He says, you are at peace now in the sleep of death and so you'll stay till the end of time. Pain and sorrow will never touch you again. Uh, but to us, of course, we're uh, affected by that. We feel bad about that. But he says, even in sleep, when mind and body alike are at rest, no one misses himself. Nobody's like, oh, I wish I was around, right? Uh, but now I'm asleep, unfortunately or sighs for life. If such sleep, he says, were prolonged to eternity, no longing for ourselves would trouble us because we'd be unconscious, right? And he goes so far as to say that sleep is kind of like a nothingness, right? It's, uh, a, you could say, almost a lack of being. And then he says, what's death? Death, therefore, must be regarded, as far as we are concerned, as having even less, and it depends on how you want to translate it, existence or being than sleep, which is in a certain sense a nothing. So you've got almost, you know, you can't actually have less than nothing, but he's using that as a figure of speech here. This is sort of what we call an a fortiori argument, where you say, listen, this is the case, and over here, that's going to be even more the case. So, you know, what is death to us? Literally nothing or even less than nothing. He says, death is followed by a far greater dispersal of the seething mass of matter. Once that break in life has intervened, there is no more waking, period. 
Um, so you're not even sleeping in death. You're just, there is no you. Death kind of doesn't exist. And then the most interesting feature about this, I kind of think, is that he has nature respond. Uh, sort of, you know, as if nature was personified. He says, suppose nature were to suddenly find a voice and round upon one of us in these terms and say, what is your here grievance? What's your problem, man? Why, why are you bitching and whining about this? Why do you give yourself up to this whining and repining? Why do you weep and wail over death? And so nature is going to introduce a couple considerations. The first one is, hey, if life has been pleasant to you so far, then you should just be like happy that you enjoyed it, sort of like a guest at a banquet. You know, you go to a dinner party and you have wonderful drinks and conversation and awesome food and the dessert comes and now the coffee and the, the hosts are kind of looking at you like, uh, okay, uh, let's, let's get our Ubers, let's get our taxis, let's get our cars, let's get out of here, right? And it's time for you to go. Do you sit around and say, can't we have some more courses? Oh, this was so wonderful. No, get your, your butt out of your chair and head out the door. You're like a, a decent guest. She says, um, why don't you retire like a dinner guest who's eaten his fill of life and take your carefree rest with a, a quiet mind? If it's been good for you, cool. Now you've had your share, right? If there, things were bad, on the other hand, why the hell do you want more of that? That's not going to do you any good, she says. Um, if all your gains have been poured profitless away and life has grown distasteful, why do you seek to swell the total? If things have become irritating, distasteful, boring for you, uh, don't keep on going on with it. You know, the new, she says, can but turn out as badly as the old and perish as unprofitably. Why not rather make an end of life and trouble, right? Um, she also talks about people who have been around for quite a while, you know. She says, um, you're withering away, withering now after tasting all the joys of life, but you're always pining for what is not and unappreciative of the things at hand. And because of that, your life has slipped away unfulfilled and unprized. Death has stolen upon you unawares before you're ready to retire from life's banquet filled and satisfied. And she says, that's not befitting. You know why? You need to get out of the way so new lives can come in and enjoy the same stuff that you have. Don't be selfish. She, she goes on and says, um, Compose your mind to make way for others. Other beings, this is very interesting, other beings need that matter that you're composed of to make themselves, to have their own lives. Get out of the way. Retire. This is the natural order of things. Just cooperate with it instead of, you know, getting all upset about it. She goes on as well, and uh, uh, the, the, actually, I, I, there is one line here. There is need of matter so that later generations may arise when they've lived out their span. They will follow you. Bygone generations have taken your road. Those to come will take it no less. So you yourself have already benefited from other people dying and getting out of the way and making their matter available to you. Do the same thing now. The, he also brings up another concern that people have. Uh, I'm going to be punished in the afterlife, like all these stories that I've heard about. There's going to be suffering. And he, he goes on and he says, As for all those torments that are said to take place in the depths of Acheron, where do we actually find them? Not in some afterlife. Here and now in our own lives. And we don't need to go over every example, but let's look at a few there is no wretched Tantalus. Tantalus was tantalized, or being a pretty bad guy, by being deprived of food and water that was always just out of his grasp down in hell, right? Um, and she says, or he says, in this life, there really are mortals oppressed by unfounded fear of the gods and trembling at the impending doom. You don't have to worry about that sort of thing, right? 
Uh, he goes on as well. Sisyphus too is alive for all to see. Where is Sisyphus? Sisyphus is this character who, again, bad guy, gets punished, has to push the boulder up the hill, then it rolls down the other way. And Lucretius is saying, there's no Sisyphus in hell. Sisyphus is right here. And he's plural. And, you know, he's not only men, but also women and everybody else. Um, what is he doing? Bent on winning the insignia of office, its rods and ruthless axes by the people's voice vote, and is embittered by perpetual defeat to strive for this profitless and never granted prize and in striving toil and moil incessantly. This is indeed to push a boulder laboriously up a steep hill, only to see it once the top is reached rolling and bounding down to the flat levels of the plane. So we make our own hell here on earth by our foolish, ungoverned, superstitious, pick whatever adjective you want, desires, fears, that we, we are contributing to things. A final consideration arguing for why death is nothing to us. Everybody dies. Nobody escapes it. He says, here is something you might well say to yourself from time to time. Even good Ancus looked his last on the daylight. A better man than you, my presumptuous friend, by a long reckoning. Death has come to many another monarch and potentate who ruled over mighty nations. So yeah, political leaders, they're all going to die. They all have died, except for the ones who are alive right now. And just give it a little bit of time and they'll all be dead. Add to it, he says, the discoverers of truth and beauty Add the attendance of the muses, among them Homer, who in solitary glory bore the scepter, but is sunk into the same slumber as the rest. I mean, Homer's stuff is still around. Cool. Homer's dead. There isn't any Homer anymore. You're not going to bother him because there isn't any him to bother. Democritus, when ripe age warned him the mindful motions of his intellect were running down, made his unbowed head a willing sacrifice to death, and the master himself. He's, of course, the master of Lucretius's school. Um, when his daylight race, was, daylight race was run, Epicurus himself died, whose genius outshone the race of men and dimmed them all as the stars are dimmed by the rising of the fiery sun. And so here's the payoff. You, uh, why are you kicking and protesting against your sentence? You're, you whose life is next door to death, Although you still live and look on the light, you're wasting a lot of your life. You're not as good as these people. They died. Why shouldn't you? Why should you worry about death then? And he ends this book by talking about this craving for life, the attempts to prolong life. He says, this is kind of foolish. They deprive us of happiness and tranquility. They actually make us miserable. We're not using the time that we have well to enjoy it. Instead, we're worrying and complaining and all these negative things. When if we just reminded ourselves that death is nothing to us, we could actually live a happy existence in the time that we have before we inevitably die. 